revelation to be able to come into an understanding of the things that you are set to hand to us in this season we give you great praise in Jesus mighty name amen you may be seated in God's presence session the major effort that I made was to try to establish the fact that the voice of God is a very unique is a unique thing I think a few Tuesdays ago I was dealing with the voice uh, yeah Tuesday was it Tuesday? During the fasting, anyway. I remember that one of the days I talked about the name, and then on Monday, I think it was on Monday that I, I, I don't remember. But I talked to you about the voice. The thing that we said then, which is applicable here also, is the fact that your voice is a very unique, is a unique gifting of the Lord. And in the same way, Everybody's voice, including the voice of God, is a unique, is unique to the person. So that, like your, like your DNA, like your fingerprint, like the blades of a leaf. We've been told that no two leaves on the face of the earth have the exact same, you know, arrangement and outline of blades. The same way that no two people have the same fingerprint. That's how your voice is unique to you. And that is how the voice of God is unique to God. So what we're trying to do in the morning was to see how do you, uh, how do you acquaint yourself with the voice of God? We did say that God speaks and everything that God has created can hear God. But then today we were looking at God's voice. That is a voice that is distinctively God's. In teaching that, there will be a number of seeming overlaps. Uh, if you listen carefully, it will look like we are saying one thing and then we are taking it away by the other things we say. That's simply because of the limitation of human models in order to properly express spiritual and divine things. If you read the passage in John chapter 10, for instance, you would realize that at some point Jesus says it's the door and then people can enter by him. And then the next thing he's saying is that he's a shepherd who actually is coming into the pen. And then there's a potter who opens to the shepherd or who will not open to a stranger. It is because Jesus stands in different relationships to the uh, believer. And those relationships are best exemplified using different analogies within the same storyline, which is the shepherd, the sheep, and then the sheep pen, and the entrance into it. So there are people that come in by some other way they, because they are not the shepherd. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the shepherd. You will not imagine that the door into the pen where sheep are kept would also be the shepherd. But that's simply because, you know, uh, human, um, human analogies sustain those kinds of limitations. So... You need to understand what I am saying part time when I use some of the kinds of uh, analogies and metaphors that I used in the morning. God has a voice that is distinctly God's. That means that voice belongs 
belongs to God and to God alone. When God is the one speaking to you, it is crucial for you to be able to isolate that voice, irrespective of what is being said. Whether what is being said looks good or does not look good, in the end, you want to find out who is saying it, who is the person that is responsible for the information that is coming to me. If it is God's voice, um, God can use his voice to say to you what is already said in scripture. Every time that that happens, it ceases to just simply be a Bible passage that came to you. In that sense, now you can say, the Lord said to me, right? So it is a written word of God that God has applied to you at that moment. God can use his voice to speak to you things that are not direct quotations out of scripture. But it is still the same God trying to bring you an information. That voice eventually is what helps you to distinguish between a God and whoever else might be talking to you. Now, we said, how do, you, um, how do you get to know the voice of God? And I said, every Christian already has had an encounter with the voice of God. Because when you were becoming born again, what you heard that triggered your response, the response that is submission to God via uh, confession and repentance, uh, and eventually leading to your being regenerated and uh, your conversion, at that instance was the voice of God. The thing that happened to you, the, the thing you heard, it was God himself that was talking at your heart. We had said that because of the texture of the speakings of God, which is what you really need to know, that texture is one that is both, um, uh, it has a, a tenor, it has a, a tenor, and at the same time, it has a quality of being imbued with power because wherever the word of the king is, there is power. So if it is a voice of God, it uniquely is distinctively the voice of God because no other person has the same kind of voice, the same voice. And if it is a voice of God, it comes with power. There's a power, whether it is loud, whether it is quiet, no matter how that word is coming to you, you are going to realize that it comes to a certain level of vitality, vitality that is consistent with God. We also said that when God speaks to you, God does not always speak to you in vocal uh, forms. God can talk to you. God can bring his voice to you in ways that are not vocal. So the speakings of God can come to you in non-vocalized uh, format. Because ordinarily, you would expect that if we are talking about the voice of God, there will be a vocal component to that. But we said in the morning that whereas uh, the voice of God can be mediated to you through um, different um, receptors, like your eyes, like your ears, like your, you know, like your skin, and I'm speaking spiritually now, because spiritually you have eyes, spiritually you have ears, and spiritually you have a capacity to feel, uh, which sometimes we talk about, you know, I feel, whatever. Now, these receptors that mirror your physical or natural senses are usually the way that God's voice come to you and then it is transported into the cavity of your being, the seat of the processing of information, which in Bible language is called your understanding. We did say that you have a faculty that is called your understanding, and your understanding can understand. Your understanding is also capable of not understanding. So Jesus had to open the understanding of his disciples so that his disciples would be able to understand the scripture. All right? Now, your understanding can be fruitful. It can be unfruitful. But you have something that is called your understanding. It is via your eyes, your ears, and you know, your senses, spiritual senses uh, at that, that the information that God wants to bring to you would generally arrive at the faculty of your understanding and then it is processed in that faculty so that you can understand it. Yet, we said, when what is in operation is 
the speakings of God, the speaking of God, or the voice of God is coming to you as a knowing, as a knowing, rather than the knowing being the conclusion, the outcome of this process of you have an information that was beamed maybe through your ears and then it traveled into your mind, into your understanding, your understanding worked on it and arrived at a position and it became fruitful so you now know what it is that you have heard, right? Whereas that is how you arrive at knowledge in this information flow. What we say with regards to knowing, the operation of knowing as a way that God's voice comes to us is that all of that process is bypassed. And so there might be no receptor encounter with the original information that God is intending to pass you by his voice, but then God goes immediately and directly to your understanding, making the information immediately available to your understanding without any intervening faculty playing, having any role to play with that information. If you are still here, say amen. amen. Everything that I try to teach in the morning is everything I have said. What did I lose, leave out? It's a fair summary, isn't it? It's a fair summary, I would say, right? We spent a lot of time with the whole understanding thing, uh, with the whole knowing thing, because like I said to you, uh, the vast majority, the, the majority of the voice of God will, that we, the majority of the instances of the voice of God that will come to you, will come to you via knowing. It's therefore important that you understand how that uh, apparatus, how that operation is carried on, because that's how a lot of the things that will happen to you in terms of your interaction with the voice of God, that's how it's going to happen. We said, therefore, if you want to get acquainted with the voice of God because you have been introduced to God's voice, your introduction to God's voice was what happened when you got born again. We use different Bible models. But if you are born again, it means that you have been introduced to the voice of God. If you have never heard the voice of God, you could never have been born again. If our discipleship was what it ought to have been generally, from that moment that you became a believer, we would have transitioned you to the Bible, to the voice of scripture component, which would have now been a very seamless way of integrating you in the corridor of interaction with the voice of God. That, that thing you heard, Whatever it was, whether you heard a voice or it was a feeling of conviction, there was something that kept telling you that you needed to take this step, which is a step of uh, repentance. The day you became born again, assuming it was something that happened to you consciously, or it was something that happened to you that you can remember, I mean to say. Now, when you go born again, that voice that you heard, the talking of the Spirit of God, it did have an information component. The way that that information component was brought to you is in keeping with the voice of God. The texture is the texture of the voice of God. That ordinarily, therefore, we would in discipleship, after you become born again, we would have introduced you to the voice of scripture. To say now that you are a Christian, you know you need to read the Bible. You know you need to study the Bible. You know you need to know the word of God. And every time that you are reading the text of scripture, as a, believer's, uh, 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 as a believer attending to the word of God, the, the, the voice, that scriptures have a voice. The voice of scripture is not different from the same voice, from the voice that told you in your heart that day that you heard the gospel, that you needed to be born again. If it is not far away from where you got born again, you might actually be able to walk your way back to that experience, to say, okay, okay, yes, I think, I think I can recollect, I can recollect the texture of that voice. It's like if you, uh, uh, um, if if somebody is trying to connect you to get married to somebody, maybe there's somebody's abroad, all right, um, and then there's a connector, and the uh, connector say, oh, there's this my friend. 
Let me not use Norway. There's this, my friend, in Germany. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So, there's this, my friend, in Germany, and that kind of thing. I now put you on conference call with the guy in Germany. You are in uh, Mangun. I am in Joss. My friend is in Germany. So, I call you in Mangun. You pick the call. And I'll add my friend who is in Germany. And then three of us now have a conversation. All right? Later on, I pass your number on to my guy who is in Germany. And now, without me in the picture, my guy now calls you. When he calls you and you pick that call, my point is that you have heard his voice once. Hmm? The day we did that conference call, you heard his voice. If he calls you a second time, you might be able to say, I've heard this voice before, even if you don't have his number. All right? Especially if it's not too long after that first conversation. You know, maybe within two weeks or something like that, a week, two weeks. If that person calls you, you go like, hmm, I've, I've heard this voice before. That's what I'm saying, that the voice that you heard the day you became born again is the same voice that you will hear when you are reading scriptures. And if we don't wait too long after you got born again, before we introduce you to the fact that scriptures has a voice, because scripture is the word of God, and it carries the voice of the God that authored it. If we had done that early enough, it would have made your journey a lot easier into the realms of acquainting yourself and mastering the voice of God in Scripture. We said, therefore, that when you are approaching Scripture, every time you are reading the text of Scripture, as a Christian who is giving expression to your Christian privilege of interfacing with the Word of God, everybody can read the Bible, but it's different from where it's different when a Christian is the one reading scriptures. Hello? Hello? Okay, maybe it's a good place to start the evening meeting. Um, this media people, does your screen, does it work? I want to read a few passages of scripture. All right, let's try. Um, because you have started giving me one look now. So, what, what did I say that I say is a good place to start the study? I remember the passage. I'm trying to find out the point. Yes? Hmm? Okay, 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 okay. Clap for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, anyone can read the word of God, isn't it? But, all right, let me see if I can pick these scriptures. Yep. Let's start from, hmm, there's supposed to be a passage in John. Well, let's read John chapter Three first. John chapter three. John chapter three, and then um, verse thirty-one. John chapter three from verse thirty-one. So Michael, I said anyone can read the scriptures, but. Even you, you didn't get the full gist. <laughs> and I hastily told you to clap for yourself. All right. Who has a full gist? Me, I've remembered. Huh? Okay. All right. Clap for yourself. Okay. Yes. I, I have the full gist. He that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that comes from, ab from heaven is above all. Let's read on. He that has seen, and what he has seen and heard, 
that he testifies. And no man receives his testimony. He that has received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. Now, remember that in verse 33, the Bible, verse 32, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no man receives his testimony. He that has received his testimony, that means that, you know, even though nobody receives his testimony, if anybody chooses to receive the testimony, that person that has chosen to receive the testimony has said to his seal that God is true. This looks a little bit confusing in the KJV. Uh, if you have another translation, well, I have other passages that will help us get this straight. Okay, let's look at chapter 7. Verse 16, chapter 7, verse 16. Maybe from verse 15, verse 15, chapter 7, from verse 15. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How? And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Verse 17 is where I'm going. Now, so Jesus is saying, my doctrine is not mine, but it is his that sent me. If any man will to do, will do his will, sorry. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, listen to this, listen to this. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying that my doctrine is not my own, all right? It's not mine, but he's that sent me. I have been sent. The person who sent me is the owner of my doctrine. It's my doctrine, but it's not mine, right? And he said, if any man will do the will of the person who sent me, if any man will do the will of the person who sent me, he said, that man shall know of the doctrine. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. If a man is not willing to do the will of the person that sent me, that person is not going to know something here. What is it that Jesus is talking about knowing? If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Which means, if I'm not willing to do the will of God, I will not be able to tell if the teaching of Jesus is of God or if it is of Jesus. Now, I want you to listen to this for a moment. So you and I, if we're present 2,000 years ago in Palestine, and Jesus is teaching, one person, one of us, wills to do the will of God. The other person is not willing to do the will of God. Jesus said, simply on the basis of this heart condition with which we come, what we are going to come out with when we hear him will be different. That anybody who has a will to do the will of the Father, that person will know whether the doctrine that Jesus is teaching, whether that doctrine is of God or is of man. That there is a discernment that is predicated on the prior intent of the heart with which you approach the matters. This is one of the major reasons why a lot of people are susceptible to deception. It is Hello? I lost like one quarter of you. We will still read another passage that will make it plainer. Believe me. So stay with this. Jesus is saying that one, two, three, four. These four uh, brothers, three brothers and a sister on this road. That if, let's assume I am Jesus and I'm teaching two of them are sincerely desirous and willing to do the will of God. Two of them are not. And when we say they are not, the possibilities are endless. 
There's a reason why somebody might not be willing to do the will of God. It may be because they don't like God, they don't believe God, but generally for many Christians, which was the last point I made, the reason is because many Christians already have a position that they are hoping that God will validate for them. There's something in their mind when they are approaching God, when they are approaching doctrine, when they are approaching the scriptures. That thing that is on their mind is what they are just hoping that Jesus or the Father will rubber stamp for them. So, because of that, it means that if God is trying to say something that is not directly in keeping with the fantasies of their heart, or let's even say the desires, the personal desires of their heart, all right, they are not willing to do it. And because they are not willing to do it, what will happen is confusion. I'll explain that. But let me finish the first explanation. So two of them are willing to do the will of God. Two of them are not willing to do the will of God. And we don't care what will they want to do. We just know that they are not willing to do the will of God. Jesus is saying the two that are willing to do the will of God, when they hear me talking part-time, somewhere in their own heart, they will have a knowing if any man shall, if any man will do his will, he, that man, shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. If you come to scripture with a personal agenda, you are a prime candidate for deception. This is why a lot of people are carried away by every wind of doctrine in church today. When they came to church, they were not coming because they loved God or they wanted God or anything like that. They, they, just, they just wanted something that can help them to survive this Buhari economy. That's all. So if, if they came and then you started doing some of the kind of things that we are doing, they say, I beg, I beg, it's calculus that they are doing in church. Is that, how, how is this going to put gote on my table? So he will be looking for where they will serve Gote for him. He is no longer pursuing the will of God. Therefore, even if the person talking is a fraud, Jesus said he will not be able to tell. Which means that the way that the seeker of God's will apprehends scripture will be different from the way that a non-seeker of God's will will apprehend scripture. I've always said one of the greatest compromisers of discernment is ambition. Personal ambition. Personal agenda. Or if you, if you approach scriptures with an ambition, if you approach spiritual things with a personal agenda and ambition, you are a target, you are a... a you are a very beautiful target for deception. And your discernment will never grow. You can't grow in discernment. Because you will process everything you see and hear through the lenses of that personal agenda, through the lenses of that personal bias, through the lenses of that personal desire. But if God will, if the only agenda you have is the will of God, then that will of God becomes the meter. It becomes the measuring stick. It becomes the plumb line with which you can evaluate what it is that you hear and see. And that is the only plumb line that is accurate. Otherwise, anything that panders to your sublime, no matter how sublime it is, no matter how, you know, faint it is, if you sustain a personal ambition, but by the way, back in the day, in the days of our father, they didn't need to put personal in front of it. Ambition was always known to be a sin. Huh? Yes, there is, there is a sin that is called the sin of ambition. See, many of you are looking at me like, eh? Ambition. In, 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 in spiritual language, ambition is a sin. Because your life is supposed to be lived in accordance with a template that is older than time. 
You were, you, were, you were brought into the world to live your life in keeping with an agenda that was made in heaven. The Bible says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before prepared that we should walk in them. That there are good works that God has before. That's Ephesians chapter 2 verse what? Verse 10. They're about, all right? That we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Unto good works. So our new creation uh, experience, our new creation destiny is good works. We, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We were created unto good works. That means we're created for the purpose of doing good works. Meanwhile, the Bible said these good works which God had before ordained. What does it mean to before ordained? It means that they were ordained before. They were ordained before what? Huh? They were ordained before, before. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm trying to show you your destiny. This is the reason why the fathers of old arrived at categorizing ambition as a sin. It's because... God didn't bring you here to find out what can happen with your life. You were his plan before you became his man. Right? So, if, if the purpose of your existence is not the discovery of that plan that existed before you became his man, you are already off track. That's the point. That there were good works that God we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. This is the ESV. Beforehand is before when? When is? Which hand? This is pre... It means that you were preordained and foreordained, if you like. For is before. To foreordain means that the ordination happened before anything else happened. That means before the foundations of the earth were laid, right? Before time began, before creation was rolled out, God had already decided how he wanted your life to end. When you come along, therefore, the greatest job that you have in your life is the discovery of the thing that was ordained and then the execution of the same. Are you with me? Yes. So, this is how ambition came to be labeled as a vice. To say, hmm, when you look around, you look around, you look and say, man, this is it, oh. This is the thing that is happening now. So, you are trying to compete with somebody else without regard to what was for ordained, what was before ordained. Are you with me? That's the context of ambition. So if you wanted to be properly ambitious, it will be now to say, if you want to be properly ambitious, it will be to say, you are very desirous of finding out the will of God for your life and you want to fulfill it to the letter. Okay? But technically, that's not the way that ambition is used in Christian language. They use it to say that desire that is a departure from the thing that God has already ordained that you should become. If you are still here, say amen. amen. All right, so where's the passage we're reading before now? We're in John, right? So Jesus is saying that the two people, for instance, who are willing to do the will of God, there is a way that that position of the heart enables them, qualifies them, legitimizes them to have a certain degree of discernment that is not available to the other two guys who are not willing to do the will of God. That everybody can hear Jesus. But the way a true Christian hears Jesus is different. You know, that's the point I'm trying to make. All right. You still are not convinced. John chapter 18. John chapter 18.
John chapter 18, verse 36. John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Verse 37. Pilate therefore said, Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou a king? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Hello? Am I convincing you gradually now? Uh -huh. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. So if you are not already of the truth, you will not hear his voice. Which means everybody can read scriptures. But the way a Christian interfaces with scripture is not the same. There is a voice that is available to you when you read scripture that is not available to the non-believer when the non-believer reads scriptures. That was the point that I was trying to make. And I've given you three Bible passages. The first one was so difficult, I don't want to explain it at all. The second one was a little bit less difficult. The third one is the least difficult. This one does not need explanation. Do you still need explanation here? Can you see? The last phrase is what my point is about. That last phrase says what? Everyone that is of the truth. And there are very powerful um, um, Greek words that are used there. When it talks about everyone that is of the truth, Hear it, my voice. We have been talking about the voice of God, God's voice. And Jesus is saying that your orientation, your alignment, determines whether you can hear his voice or not. Meanwhile, he said, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. So Jesus came to bear witness unto the truth. Yet, he said, it is everyone that is of the truth that we hear my voice. Which means, if anybody is, where it begins is this, if anybody sincerely says, I want to know the right way. If I find, if I ever find the right path, I'm going to follow it. If that is the position of the heart of somebody, if they hear the gospel, they will repent. Hmm? But if somebody has said, the thing I am looking for in this life is how to blow. Hmm? If somebody has said, the thing I'm looking for in this life is how to blow, they may not be in the place where they can respond appropriately to the gospel when they hear it. There is a heart orientation. There is a, an alignment, a pre-commitment that will determine what you are able to do when the truth is before you. Hello? To be off the truth means, if you look at other translations, it will be anyone that is on the side of the truth. Anyone that is on the path of the truth. All right? Uh, everyone who is of the truth, well, listens to my voice. He still uses the word off. And that word is the word ek in the Greek. It is the word source. It's the word for origin. It's the word for yeah, origin. Like, where are you coming from? Everyone that is on the side of the truth listens to me or hears my voice. Whoever belongs to the truth listens to me. That's the uh, GNT. So if you don't belong to the truth, you will not hear his voice. That's what it means. So a Christian can be reading scripture and a non-Christian is reading scripture because he's doing CRK or CRS. They are non-theistic uh, Bible teachers in seminaries. There are people that are supposed, they are theologians, 
Well, I can't call them theologians. There are people that are Bible scholars who do not believe that God exists. And I'm not talking to you theoretically. We know people like that by name. Are you with me? That they are, they are Bible scholars, they are renowned in their fields. Yet, they do not even believe that God exists, let alone that scriptures might be true. If he is reading John chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm reading John chapter 1, verse 1, we're having two completely different experiences. Because me, I am on the side of the truth. Therefore, I will hear the voice of Jesus in the reading of that passage. He is not on the side of the truth. Therefore, he will not hear the voice of Jesus. We are talking about God's voice. Are you with me? All right. Having made that point, therefore, let's continue. So, a non-Christian can read scripture, but when a Christian reads scripture, it's a different experience altogether. They are, are, the access to the voice of God that you have is usually predicated on the state of your heart. Oh, if you are a sincere seeker, if you are a sincere seeker, I already mentioned that. That if you are on the side of the truth, if you are sincerely looking for truth, to say, I am confused, but I truly want to know the truth. Because if I find the truth, I'm going to follow it. If I find the truth, I'm going to do it. If that is your orientation, you would realize that you will hear the beckonings of God. Whether it is somebody preaching, or it is somebody teaching, or it is the same Bible that you are reading, you will hear the beckoning of God. The, the drawings of God, you will hear it. That's why somebody needs to help me find that teaching I did. I did a teaching, I can't remember if it was in the Jesus Manifesto or something like that. There was a teaching that I did where I taught about the fact that the gospel is meant to be preached to the poor. How many of you remember? The, all right, so somebody should find it for me. Now, find that audio for me. I, I did a teaching, because Jesus said in Luke chapter four, 4, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Why is the gospel supposed to be preached to the poor? He didn't say, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the lost. Is to preach it to the poor. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. In John, in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, verse 2, let's read very quickly. Jesus, um, Matthew 11, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence, that means he departed from there, to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, verse 3, and said unto him, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? What was Jesus' response? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. What are the things? The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So for some reasons, scriptures continue to insist that the gospel is to be preached to whom? To the poor. You would say, why not to the lost? The answer is in that audio. Does anybody know how to find that audio? I can't teach you. You know how to find it. Eh? All right. So the technical people will find it. We'll highlight it on the Telegram platform. Now, it's important because it was a full teaching. I can't go into it now. All right? I, only to say to you that I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that the orientation of the heart, the prior orientation of the heart, is very important with regards to whether you can make profit out of the speakings of God or not. There are things that God will be sharing like this. 
God is sharing salvation. This one is lost. 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 But he gives to three out of five that are lost and he does not give to the other two. You now say, but why did he do give these other two? He said, they are not poor. You say, but they are lost. He say, yes, but being lost is not sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You, on top of being lost, you still need to be poor. Because if you are not poor, you, you, you cannot apprehend it. Let's just leave it like that. When you listen to that audio, you would understand why. But my point is, the, the state of the life of the person, in this context, is called being poor, is what qualifies the person for having the gospel preached to them. Even if every other person around him is lost, the one that is poor, is the one that will have effective business with the gospel. So, when Jesus came into the world, according to John chapter 1, he said, the Bible says, that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. So you realize that when the writer was now saying in the 14th verse that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. If this was what they saw, are you with me? That when Jesus came into the world, he said, the world was made flesh. That's Jesus came into the world and dwelt among us. He lived among us. And we beheld his glory. He did not say the world beheld his glory. It's a class. That class is called we. We beheld his glory. I'd like you to realize that the people that killed Jesus are not among this we. They are not part of this we. If you are a part of this we, you cannot also be part of the people that crucified him. The issue, therefore, is how did the same person come into the world? Some people looked at him and they were like, Hail! Hail! Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Save me. Meanwhile, another group of people saw the same person and they say, you are a villain. Die! Wait, how is it that the same person doing the same thing jesus is living life and some persons are grateful to god for sending them such a prophet and some other person are burning they are dying with rage and they are plotting to kill meanwhile the experience of a group of people is glorious they are they are in ecstasy they are this is the days of our life this is the messiah that was promised you know the difference? The difference is the prior orientation of the heart. Anyone that is of the truth hears my voice. If you are not of the truth, oh, you will not hear my voice. And I'm sure you understand the context of hearing here now. So this hearing my voice means to, to, to embrace it. It means to respond positively to it. Like we have said before, it is not necessarily to say uh, you, your ears may not even hear the wordings. You will. But we are saying that you will not have an effective response that is appropriate to the voice because you do not believe in it. And why is it that you don't? It's not because there's a deficiency in the voice. It is because of the orientation of your heart. You are not on the side of the truth. This one came and he is the truth. And he came to bear witness to the truth. So only people that have a hunger, a heart that is seeking and willing to find the truth, only they will find, will listen to this one. So this ties very strongly to the teachings that we do on discernment. Your discernment will be compromised if you approach spiritual things with personal ambition. If, you are, if, you are, if the only preoccupation of your heart is not truth, 
is not the will of God. You cannot be accurate. You may be appearing to be sincere, but you still will not be accurate. Huh? Hello? If, if the mantra of your life is believe women, believe women. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that's their mantra. Believe women. Hmm? There are people that their mantra is eh, me, I did not come to just to... Well, I don't even know what you can count here. But, alright? I, I, I did not come to just to come and suffer. Now, I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that usually the people who are willing to do the will of God, whether they suffer or not, they have a higher chance of not suffering than those that make their objective the avoidance of suffering. You see how those people that used to say, if I perish, I perish. You see how they don't used to perish. You remember? Yes. If I perish, I perish. The moment, the moment your orientation is the will of God, like, you know what? God, we are in this for your sake. Esther, if I perish, I perish. She did not perish. Three Hebrew boys. Our God whom we serve is able to save us from your very fullness. But even if he decides not to, we are not in doubt with regards to his ability. He is able. But if he chooses by the exercise of divine wisdom, that the way we bear testimony is to go as martyrs, if that's what God chooses, we still will not bow. We know God is able, but if he chooses not to exercise that ability, we will not bow. You know they did not burn. Yes. It is the people that want to save their lives that will lose it. That's how Jesus put it. Because when we teach some of these things, people think that we are trying to make you take the oath of poverty. No. We are trying to say that you need to seek the kingdom of God first. That has to be it. The reason why a lot of people are off on a tangent and they are not aware. Because the same personal ambition that is driving you is the same reason why people are taking advantage of you. So you will suffer in the bush for 17 years, then you will come back with tears and say, man, I wasted my life. I wasted my life. You will not be able to recover those years. What sent you on that needless, fruitless, wilderness errand of your own devising was because you thought you were so wise. You were wise in your own conceit. And because you were not willingly submitted to the will and the purposes of God, there was no way that you could be accurate in your pursuit. The thing you are looking for, the thing you are looking for, will determine whether you can make profit with Jesus or not. If you are, if you are not here for the sake of God, like, hmm? oh, use me, Lord, use even me, just as thou will, and when and where. All right? If that is not the orientation of your heart, and that is not the orientation of the hearts of many people. That's why false prophets are flourishing. The thing you thought you were taking away from God by not submitting to God, you can't keep it. You are still going to give it to somebody else. But I want you to know that whoever you give it to is less. Anybody else you give is less. And this thing I have just said is the textbook definition of idolatry. You are an idolater. When you give the honor and glory that is due to God alone, when you give it to anything else, that's idolatry. And I want you to know that the ways of idolaters will be hard. To be hard. Part of the point I'm making here is to bring you to the point of total submission to the will of God. It is there that your prosperity is guaranteed. You will begin to prosper in your spirit. And I can tell you that the portrait of the blessed man is such that that thing that is going on in your spirit, no matter how long it takes, it will eventually break out into your soul. It will eventually break out into your body. And it will eventually engulf the totality of your life. But the point is that when you are dealing with this God, line will have to be upon line. 
precept will have to be upon precept. It will be here a little, there a little, but eventually you will realize that you have made progress. The man that is looking for the shortcut will find out that it was a shortcut to nowhere. And that discovery sometimes will be made after a decade, sometimes after two decades. There are people now that, I don't want to talk a lot of stories because, you know, I have the mic and people are listening to me. But I can tell you in confidence that we have heard the stories of people. There, there were people that those days, they felt that some of us we have decided that our lives were not going to amount to anything because of our orientation. There's a way you can scheme. No matter what you think God has called you to do, there's a way you can still scheme inside it. You can accept that, okay, God said ministry. I should do ministry. There is still a way to do ministry with ambition. Huh? It, God said, my calling in life is to be a classroom teacher. You can still do it with ambition. And every time you are doing that, part of what you are saying is that you are passing a vote of no confidence on the will of God for your life. That this is my life. If I live it exclusively to the way that God wants to run it, I am not absolutely sure that I will end well. So you need to devise something of your own by your human wisdom and intelligence in order to either augment or to replace the thing God has said. You say, she is preaching, you say I should do. Just leave the rest to me. Now, you, you use your own method, you use your own methodology, you use your own strategy, your own system. You eventually become such a mutation that when God looks from heaven, now he cannot recognize you. Now, it, this was not what we sent. But you will still be telling people, I know the day that I had that encounter when the Lord said to me, you are my servant and I'm sending you to the ends of the earth. And when you are saying that, you were not telling a lie. But when you left home that day, that was the last time you did anything God's way. You say, is it not Jerusalem we are going? We know the road. You abandoned your star that God sent to lead you. That was how you ended up with Herod. And that was how it, it, the catastrophe that Rachel was now weeping and children, boys, two years and below, they lost their lives because a group of seekers of Jesus will not stay in track with their star. You know, if they stayed with that star, they would not have ended in the palace of Herod. The star would have led them to where the baby was. But they know that this is the king of the Jews. Where's the headquarter of the Jewish nation? Jerusalem. Hey, Jerusalem, here we come. The star that was leading them was too slow for their liking. It was after they had gone into Jerusalem, they had entered into the palace of the king, and I want you to know that that did not happen in two hours. It didn't happen in one day. It was a caravan. And if you know anything about Middle Eastern hospitality, you will understand that when they came into the, the Bible said the city, Jerusalem was moved about them. Then they find the palace of the king, and they are now the protocol is like when you come to Nigeria and you want to go and see the president. It's not something that can happen in 30 minutes and then you are out. We don't know how many days they spent in the palace of Herod. But at the very least, I can tell you that was not a one-day affair. They didn't step out the day they stepped in. However long they stayed, when they had talked with Herod and they, you know, they had been fed and all of that, Herod has called his uh, scribes and the Pharisees and said, wait, to, this king of the Jews that they are talking about, if at all he is born, where will he be born? The scribes check their books and they say, ah, oh, Micah, Micah told us. Oh, Bethlehem, even though you are small, you are not the least among my people. For out of you will come the governor whose goings have been from of old. If the Messiah at all is born, the place we find him will be in Bethlehem. Then Herod told the guys, the wise men, said, okay, you go to Bethlehem, you'll find him. When you find him, come and give me word so that I also will go and worship. After all of that exercise had been done, and they finally departed from the palace of Herod, and they came out, the Bible now said that star that they left in the east was just arriving. Because you cannot put God under pressure. Huh? The star was just coming and going. Then these guys were like this. Huh? But after that, they are detour and they were out. They realized that 
that star they saw in the east was still on, is still on a journey. You know that eventually the information they got from the scribes and the Pharisees and Herod was not what helped them to identify the boy. Oh, you, do you think that there was only one house in Bethlehem? So when you now enter Bethlehem, how will you still know which house? The king of the Jews has been born. But you know what the star did? Egomo, with, with specificity. The star went ahead of them until it got over the roof of where the boy was to be and he stopped there. So the entire journey and detour into the palace of Herod was wasted. The time that they thought they were gaining by running ahead of the star, did they gain any time? No. They did not arrive before the star. But they have left a huge liability. A carnage was occasioned on account of that detour. Because now, Herod had been told there has been premature information given to Herod. And so Herod, realizing that the wise men didn't come back his way, decided to set himself against the king that will be born to usurp his throne and authority. And Many innocent young boys in Israel were slaughtered because a group of seekers of God were too much in a hurry to, to stay on track with the star that was supposed to be their, na that, their navigator. So it's not even enough to say, I have decided, I know what God has called me to do, I'm going to do it. No, 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 it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. You can handle the word of God and see handle it deceitfully. Have you read it in scripture? Yes. Paul saying that we are not like them. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. And we don't handle it for filthy lucre. Time and time again, people have told me, they have told some of us, say the kind of thing people are preaching, <laughs> you are not planning to go anywhere. They're not planning to go anywhere with this kind of hard, hard things. Because there are people that think that we are intentional killjoys. Like, no matter how happy you are, you can be happy until you meet us because we are going to make you sad. And they think it's, they think it's, it's a decided ambition of the life. No, 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 no. No. But I can tell you, I can tell you that the thing we saw 20 years ago it's not, we are not even there yet. But there is a burden that the Lord has shared with some of us. And it constrains us. It does not matter anymore. Huh? He, 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 you know, they, this man said, nothing, none of these things moved me. None of these things moved me. If it is, if it is poverty, if it is poverty, I'd like you to know that poverty cannot kill me. Are you with me? Are you with me? You see, you are not with me. Well, let me tell you also that in case you are afraid, poverty cannot kill you. Huh? Just lay down your ambition and look for the will of God. Sometimes it will be hard. It will be hard. Because there will be many things that your muscles can do that are not captured in your purpose. At that point, you will now need to tell yourself that, man, it is true. God does not have delight in the strength of a horse or in the legs of a man. It, because where I come from, we know how to run this kind of thing. But when you check the ledger of your destiny, you would realize that it's not captured. Hi! Like now that everybody is jumping out of Nigeria. Huh? Having an opportunity to live is not the same thing as being appropriate. It, the fact that it is possible does not mean that it is proper. Hmm? They can even give it to you on a platter. Then you will go and open the ledger of your destiny and realize that hi, huh? Taiwan was not captured. So you are like God. Now like this we go day. Now like this we go day. You are, you are supposed to, you need to come to the point where you become the slave of your destiny. It is at that point that you have started to live.
you know what you, you know what God said? He said, if you call unto me, I will answer you, and I will show you. It, it, this is not the product of your imagination. We are not talking about positive thinking here. I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. There is greater, I want you to know that there is greater excitement and ambition and uh, an adventure in your original destiny than anything that you can think or imagine. Because eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the minds of men. The things that God has prepared for them that love him, but these things are revealed to us by his spirit. For the spirit of God searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. I'm saying to you that there are things that your eyes have not seen, your ears have never heard. They've not crossed your mind. The things that pertain to your destiny, yet there is a revealer. You know the point? The point, however, is that many people, instead of staying and doing business with the revealer, they will rather concoct things by the employment of the feeble possibilities of their ostentatious mind. I'd like you to know, I'd like you to know, that when you go to ask God, if your, um, if your destiny in God, if it does not if it does not start to and baffle you, if it looks, ah, is it just this kind of simple thing that you want me to do? You have not yet started hearing God. He said, I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I want you to know that there is no child of God whose destiny is small. No. Excuse me. If there are great and mighty things that God can show you, why are you trying to manufacture things? Have you seen the one God wants to show you? You are just puffed up in your mind. And you say, man, the way this thing is now, somebody has a plan for himself. Because even the Bible says, wisdom is profitable to direct. Can I tell you what wisdom is? The fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. So don't say wisdom is profitable to direct. So you now sit down and run a SWOT analysis of your life in Nigeria and then your life in California. And you say, on the basis of this SWOT analysis, California is 80%. Hmm? Nigeria is 19. You don't need you don't need a prophet to tell you that California is the place. Huh? The Bible said and in the same year Isaac sold in the same land. And Isaac reaped a hundredfold in the same land. Remember that that year in that land there was famine. Are you with me? What I'm dealing with tonight is very powerful in the quest to be acquainted with the voice of God. We are saying that if you have personal ambitions, you will not prosper in the venture of acquainting yourself with the voice of God because it is anyone that is on the side of the truth that will hear my voice. And this alone explains the confusion of so many people. So many people are confused because of this. Now, as we go on Ah, I wanted to say something before I start teaching. I don't. Let me still say it. As we go on, you are going to realize that there is an orientation of heart. I've not touched anything I wanted to do this evening. I tell you the truth, I lie not. 
this evening I wanted to talk to you about those receptors. Eyes that see, ears that hear, and the heart that understands. Is that okay? Hello? And then I wanted to talk to you about dreams, visions, trances. Oh. Glory to God. <laughs> we, need, we, need, we need a thinking with scriptures day. Just seven hours of Bible teaching. Because now we are doing male and female. If I now say we'll continue on Tuesday with this thing, see, male and female again will go into the drawer for a long time. So we're going to have to find a way to continue this teaching. Because if you are talking about the voice of God, hearing the voice of God, I need to teach you the different ways that God speaks. Isn't it? Yes. God will speak to you through your eyes visually. You will see things. God will speak to you through your ears. You will hear things. God will fertilize your heart. All right? That's the knowing that we talked about. Now, there are other handles that God can use. That this, all of these speaking things can come to you in a dream. It can come to you via a vision. It can come to you in a trance. Is that okay? It can come to you by an audible voice. God can even lead you by providence. I really wouldn't need to teach on that because you really don't have any control over that. There's what is called providence. And I've been in the way the Lord has led me here. All right? It's that kind of thing. This guy is going to get a wife for Isaac. He, he, he did not arrange for Rebecca to be there at the well. He was just on the right path. And he bumped into Rebecca. It's providence. Are you with me? It's like Joseph. Joseph knew he was supposed to be this big guy and all of that. His brothers wanted to do the exact opposite. When they sold Joseph, Joseph would have thought that, hmm, this is my thing now. It's not looking like he's walking. And the brothers would have felt that we have brought an end to it. It was in the course of that drama that Joseph ran into the crown. It's providence. It, Joseph did not, God didn't tell him, this is the way to the palace. But the Lord was with him. Then, uh, the reason why I said there was something I wanted to say was the fact that, is the fact that there is the provision of God in the voice of God that is this thing that we said before. For God is the one who walks in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Are you with me? I wanted to say that because I was talking of ambition. Because there is a way that when God has conquered you, when, when God has conquered you, God speaking to you can be so immediate in your experience that it does not have the external feel of something coming from outside to you. So, it will look as if you are the originator of this idea. Now, this thing is the process, is a proceed of your natural thinking processes. And so, you may no longer be sure whether this is really God's will or it is not God's will. Is this the outcome of this process. Is this the speaking of God to me or not? Because it looked like it was just me, 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 me. I, I also need to teach that. I've taught that in bits and pieces before, but within the context of teaching as a package on hearing God's voice, it's important to teach that because God is the one at working you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The, the, you now need to understand how do I discern when the thing that I have Taught, that I think I have taught or I have willed. How do I know if it is still the voice of God to me? There are indicators that will help you to decide. Even if you were to sit down and then you did an analysis and all of that. Like I'm an itinerant preacher. When people invite me to preach, how do I decide on what to accept and what not to accept? For instance, and eventually when I make that decision, how do I know, how can I be confident that the ones I've decided to accept are in keeping with God's will. And the ones I've decided not to accept are not in keeping with God's will. I need to teach you what that grid looks like. Grid. When I say grid, G-R-I-D. Is that okay? All right? Uh, you, you, you need to understand that grid because 
Every time that God speaks to you, it's not going to be spectacular. Every time God speaks to you, it's not going to have the external feel like something came to me, like something said to me. God is at liberty to employ the apparatus of your mind and your will. It is God that is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That there is a position of heart and life that you arrive at that the thing you will to do it's a reflection of the purposes of God, the will of God. It is the speakings of God that welled up inside you as your will. Are you with me? This is part of the offerings. This is part of the result of the process of transformation. When you are not conformed to this world and you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you will facilitate that, that, that progression facilitates this possibility where God is at home in your vessel. So much so now that because there is really no conflict anymore between what you want to do and what God wants you to do, you don't have the sense of an external impute coming in because your will now lies buried in the purposes of God. And I want you to know that it is not a miracle, it's not a gift. Nobody has a gift of submission to the will of God. <laughs> huh? I, I used to find it quite interesting. When somebody passes on, they will say, with gratitude to God and in total submission to the will of God, we, the family of this, we want to announce. This. I'm like, okay, what options do you have? If you, you, okay, let's assume you don't want to submit to the will of God. So what will you do? <laughs> huh? What will you do? You will not bury the person. <laughs> or you raise him back. Say, God wanted you dead, but we did not yet agree, so come back. When we submit to his will, we can send you back. That's not possible. But there are situations where you actually can submit to the will of God. That the, the success of this enterprise, where you say, he must increase, I must decrease. The, that inverse relationship, where you are going down and he's going up, that is how you find your original self. Because your original self in God, your original self in God, is supposed to be the first Adam before the fall, where Adam is naming things as Adam, and God is watching Adam name things, and everything that Adam was naming was accurate. The Bible says, and whatever Adam called every animal, that was the name thereof. I've explained that, that that also means that it was the name of the animal that Adam called the animal. Did you get that? Hmm? In Genesis chapter uh, 3, uh, verse 18, there about, verse 20, 21, there about. Now, that God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would call, call them. And the Bible now says that Whatever Adam called every animal, that was the name thereof. When God was bringing those animals to Adam, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. It was the name of the animal. The name of the creature was what Adam called the creature. I explained it. I've explained it to you. Like God came with a ledger. The taxonomical ledger of creatures. And he's watching. And he calls Adam. Brings the creatures. He said, what will you call this one? Adam looked at it. And said, kangaroo. God said correct, because that's the name. It was the name of the thing you actually just called. This one, what do you call this one? Adam looked at it and said, you are lion. God said, you see? You are right. That's the name. That whatever Adam 
called every living creature. That was the name thereof. This is the thing that we are calling, that we say God is the one at work in you, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. That the thing you are willing and you are doing is exactly the thing that God would will and God would do. But you are the one willing it and doing it. Are you with me? That was where Adam was before. And God needed to do that to Adam because God was going to take a Sabbath. God was taking a sabbatical. God was trying to say to Adam, when I leave, I want you to continue from where I stopped. Adam would be second guessing himself that how can I be the continuation of something that an infinite God began? I won't be able to do it. God say, the way I will do it is the way you will do it. Eh? Yes. The way I will do it, if I'm the one directly doing it, that's the way you will do it when you are the one doing it. This is why I made you in my image after my likeness. Eh? The proof was the naming of the creatures. It was to let Adam know that, see, if I was the one that was calling the name on this guy, I will call him Lion. That's exactly what you have done. So when I leave and you resume work on day 8, because God was working for every day, creation day for 6 days, and then on the 7th day, he took a break, right? But the break of God that God took was not supposed to be the end of the creative process. It was just simply that somebody else was to, supposed to be the continuation of what God had begun. In order to instill confidence in that functionary, God gave him this opportunity to have him do something and then to make him know that he will not do differently than what God will do. When you get to that state of affair, when you get to that position in your discipleship, you have arrived at that place where God is at work in you to will. Your will is sponsored. All right? But you are usually not cognizant of the prior work, the back end that precipitates as your will. So you just will to do something, but what you are willing to do is exactly in keeping with the purposes of God because it was the work of God inside you that was behind the arrival of your will and disposition. Yet, it now feels like this is what I will. This is what I will. And when I will it, I do it. So, in knowing that your will is the voice of God, there are now tests that you need to run. Are you with me? And then there are matters on which that is easily applied. So, those will be the things that I will teach when we continue this teaching. Because we need to pray. Hallelujah. We're going to find an opportunity to continue. Maybe it might be next step, I don't know. But, with everything I've said to you, you can tell that we are still just largely at the introductory phase of the subject matter. God can speak to you by a dream. How do you know if a dream is from God or if it's the business of the day that gave birth to it? God can speak to you by a vision. God can speak to you by a trance. God can speak to you by an audible voice. God can speak to you by a still small, a small still voice. Like it happened in the days of Elijah, right? God can speak to you by a knowing. And I've already tried to explain that a bit. The reason why I spent time with that from the start is because that is the bulk of the way that you are going to be getting the voice of God, is a knowing. You will just know that this is what God wants me to do. You will just know. You didn't hear it, you didn't feel it, you didn't sense it. You just, it just organically arose. It just kind of showed up in your heart. Then you wait. Of course, there are different tests that you can run. You can run the scripture test. You can run the peace test, right? Hello? Yes. Uh, peace and convenience are not the same thing. The will of God will be peaceful even when it is painful. The will of God is not always going to be painless. It can be painful, but it will still be peaceful. That's why Jesus said, Peace I give unto you, my peace give I unto you, not as the world give it. The peace of the world, it fluctuates with circumstances and situations. 
It's different from the peace of God. That's why the peace of God is beyond understanding. It passes all understanding. And it becomes a guard that can guard your heart and your soul. So, the will of God, I'm saying to you, can lead you into painful places. It, it, you can't use pain to determine whether it is God's will or not, but you can use peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can use peace to determine if it is the will of God. You can use scripture to determine if it is the will of God. So, there are those kinds of tests that you need to run when you are using some of these other means by which God speaks to you. And we will need to teach that. And I'll need to show that to you from scripture. Because um, the, everything I'm saying, basically, as much as there are things that experientially can be affirmed, the, the root of it is what? Is scripture. We have a more sure word of prophecy that you will do well to take heed unto as unto a shining uh, light that shines out of darkness unto the day star arises in your heart. So, no matter what the experience is and all of that, scripture says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And that word in context for you and I is a scripture. So, by the grace of God, when we come back around this, uh, we've done actually we've done most of the heavy liftings. We've done the doctrinal basis, the doctrinal foundations for these things. What is left is generally just a list to say there's this way that God speaks, there's this way God speaks, there's this way God speaks, there's this way and this is how to differentiate, you know, if it is God-sponsored dream or if it is a demonically sponsored dream or if it is a business of the day sponsored dream, right? Uh -huh. A vision is a vision. It's very simple. And then there's a trance, right? Hello? So we will just run through that list at some point and I will give you characteristics of each and how you may run the necessary checks in order to affirm the validity or the legitimacy of that mode of instruction or information that has arrived in your vessel if it is truly of God or not. But I've given you some of the greatest tools that you need. Submission to the will of God. If your heart is not in that place, you are wrong and initial. Like, you are not going anywhere with this. Anyone that is on the side of the truth hears my voice. And anyone that, if any man will to do the will of God, will do the will of God, he will know of my doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Are you with me? Yes. So there is a guarantee that God gives that if you, if, you, if you align your heart rightly, God will lead you. God will lead you. Even, even if you are not very mature and experienced in the things that we have taught, God will see to it, God will see to it, that the orientation of your heart does not go unrewarded. So if you are a sincere seeker of truth, and your heart is in the right place, in the search for truth, God will come to you. Hallelujah. Now, in the next few minutes, the next few minutes, we are going to do something that the Lord said to us earlier in the day. And what is it? Call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know of. It is a good time to start to call. Before you make any request, I'd like you to pray in the Holy Ghost for some two minutes. Just, just, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Just saturate yourself. Just saturate yourself. Immerse your spirit. Immerse your soul. Just pray in the Holy Ghost if you can, if you know how to. Just pray in tongues. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's what this prayer is about.
we want to approach we want to approach as a congregation we want to approach Balina so semine Bafati se sami no tagabe raskibi la kame na se sami Avila na so se libanga po nisa Rakene se sami ni kabara katan se zilame Arena se saimo tabara na tua kaito babariate Mafes ka vila so melanta si lebani Arinas kem brofanase saminan ta kapruna fefalia Arinas e saminan ta gombe barati Alemena sabro falanina kapanina so seila Arini se samiman babarati lemena taso Amina se samimo babarati sa sei Maile mena, 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 na mona na ma mena na malase same, a me me malame se sabi atame. Ai benes ke brofes ka vele mena tamo. Abini se semina atwa kabarina se selemena. You who dwells between the cherubim, shine forth. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh counts for nothing. Go ahead and engage the spirit. And ye be law, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Pray in the spirit. Amos e seme ma barana tago. Melinas ke profe kasali matama. Abrinina kamba barakine se simina. Alemos a semi a kambo baranino kobe. Ali se si ma kamo kota kaye be lama se semila Braba baba bara tama baba lama Ale mena ta se semila twa nako paparata Ale mena sa zimina twa kai papa na sese Araske baraki tana su baraki na kato Ami se semia ta baraki Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy, that we may obtain mercy, that we may find grace to help in our time of need. Oh wow God is activating God is activating receptors Ears that hear Eyes that see A heart that is quick to understand You will not be dull of hearing You will not be dull of hearing you will not fail in perception. You will not be low in vision. You will see. You will hear. You will understand. Your eyes they see. Your ears they hear. Iyanasa, Iyanasa, Iko male komo taba. Sabilini kemelataso, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. <laughs> you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. <laughs> you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. 
you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth ha shine forth shine forth you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth ha ha and na so semena na ko bela mena na tabala mo ipa mama mama mo ma mena mena na ha 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 i na se semena na na ipa na 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 so mara na ko mela mena i bela mena so se berena mena you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth the Lord is in the house. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Hey, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. <laughs> you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine, 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 shine. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Oh, shine forth. Shine forth. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. I love Moses and Anako. You who dwell between the cherubim, oh, shine forth. Here, Nessa, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. I must have a, I must have a, I must have Between the cherubim, shine, shine, shine. Shine, shine between the cherubim. Shine for shine. You who dwell right now, God is recalibrated. God is recalibrating the receptors of men and of women. Recalibrating your eyes. Recalibrating your ears. Recalibrating your heart. Oh, you who dwell, you who dwell. Shine, shine, shine. Shine between the cherubim, shine for shine you who dwell, shine, 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 shine. Between the cherubim, shine for the Lord is in this place, and we know it. 
Jesus is in this place and we know it we reverence you we hail your majesty Shine for God will be in your heart. You will receive signals from the headquarters. You will hear God. It is the spirit that quickens. You have been quickened. You who dwell between the cherubim shine forth in our hearts. You who dwell between the cherubim shine forth. <laughs> you who dwell between the cherubim break out You dwell between the cherubim. Break forth. <laughs> oh, you dwell between the cherubim. Come now. Speak now. You dwell between the cherubim. Break forth. You will hear God. You will hear God. You will hear God. He will break out. He will break out. He will break out. Oh, you who dwell. Between the cherubim, break out. Yeah, you dwell between the cherubim, break forth. Oh, you dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. The Spirit of the Lord is at work in this place. Call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I want to give you the next two minutes by divine allowance. You can make a request because God will answer. There's a marriage that is about to tear apart. And I see God bringing intervention into that marriage now. For what do you make request? The hand of the Lord will be mighty in this place in a brief moment of time. There will be answers. You will hear God. He said, I will answer. You will hear from God. You dwell, you 
Can you rise to your feet? Oh, you dwells. Shine for you who dwells. Can you lift up your hands wherever you are? We're out of time. We need to wrap up the service. The spirit of the Lord is so heavy in this place. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord remove things out of the bodies of people. I saw the Lord touch the eyes of people. I saw the Lord fine tuning people's capacity to hear, to see, to perceive in the spirit. I see the spirit of reconciliation bringing restoration to parent child relationships, to husband wife relationships. He says, Call unto me and I will answer. And I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I want to pray a general prayer so we can close this service. Whatever the situation is, the hand of the Lord is coming upon you. The spirit of prophecy is coming upon somebody. I just saw that. The spirit of prophecy is coming upon somebody. God will bring you into a new experience of utterance. A new experience of utterance is a spirit of prophecy. Your vocal cords are going to be immersed in a very terrific, fiery anointing. The spirit of prophecy. For some of you, God will open your eyes. For some of you, God will heal your body. The hand of the Lord is mighty in this house. Those of you following us online, I'd like you to know that you are not excluded from this atmosphere. The hand of the Lord is mighty in this place. And you are in this place. If you are part of this meeting, you are in this place. The hand of the Lord is mighty in this place. Restorations are taking place. Renewal is going on. Recalibration is going on. Re Fine tuning is going on. Healings are taking place. A spirit of prophecy is coming upon you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for the release of the sundry spirits of God. Yes, the spirit of prophecy is about to break out of your life. Your vessel is about to receive an investment, a divine deposit of the prophetic. Wherever you are, it's coming upon you now. Yes, receive now. One, two, receive three, receive four. 
Yes, receive. Receive. Five. Yes. Yes. Lord, from my right hand side to my left, from the front to the back, from the back to the front, I declare the removal of everything that infirms, everything that afflicts. I release you from every infirmity, from every sickness, from every disease. I declare that from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, you are healed from every infirmity. You are healed from every disease. In the name of Jesus, I declare that your eyes they see, your ears they hear, your heart it perceives. In the name of Jesus, by the mercies of God, there is a going on of the activity of recalibration. God is refine tuning your instrument, refine tuning your receptors. You will not be led astray. You will not think amiss. You will not ask amiss. You will know what to do because you will hear from God. The one that says, when you call, I will answer. He answers you now. Receive your answer. 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 Online and on site. Receive your answer. Receive your answer. 